Today's topic is one I always wanted to cover. I wrote the ideas down for months, but never got around to making the actual script. Well, that changes now, as I go over the villains you might understand, despite their actions. Yes, the sympathetic villains. Villains are, in a way, supposed to be despised. Their terrible actions are cruel and heinous, and in the end, you feel triumphant when they finally go down for the count. Yet, despite this, the media has gone out of its way to try and have us understand their motives and perhaps feel sorry for them. Deep down, their reasons are justified, and though we have to stop them, we almost don't want to. These are 10 examples from games where it either almost works or works too well, the ranking depending on how well the villain is done. Do their actions justify the means? Well, prepare for some confusion, or better or worse. Let's get started. A common trend that some sympathetic villains share, for better or worse, is their villainy is a plot twist, thus a twist villain. Their misdeeds are meant to be a surprise, which for some work, and others... Well, most modern Disney villains can tell you on the other side of that. Here's one example that shockingly works. And it comes from the lovely indie title, Doki Doki Literature Club. Disguised as a visual novel dating sim, deep in its code is a psychological horror that messes with your mind. It gets dark, man. Really dark. You better heed that warning well when you start the game. And it's all because of one individual, the very president of the Literature Club, Monica. Doki Doki Literature Club was always meant to be a dating sim, allowing you to date one of three girls, Sayori, Yuri, or Natsuki. However, being the president of the Literature Club allowed Monica certain privileges, including knowing she was in a game and could never be chosen to date. Knowing this, she decided to mess with the game and begin to make her friends detestable for Monica to have a chance. Despite her efforts, the girls got closer to the protagonist, and with no option left, she had to take two very drastic measures. First came Sayori, and the others soon followed, even deleting their files to leave only Monica and her true love. It isn't the protagonist she loves, though, but the player on the other side of the screen. Without a coded ending for her, she decided to make one for herself, where she comes out happily ever after, no matter the cost. Only by turning the tables and deleting Monica's file does she truly realize what she had done, returning the game to its normal state, but this time without the president. While it's true her sympathetic nature depends on how you view her actions, what cannot be denied is her motives behind them. To realize you have no happy ending, to be on the sidelines while your friends are eternally happy, would it not drive you to obtain it by force, to get what you think you truly desire? She never wanted to delete her friends, or force the player to experience the horror of what had it done, but to get what she wanted, well, I think you get the drift. Even when you two are alone, she still presents her kind nature, and truly meant to be happy together with you. Leave the screen on Monica for a while and she'll engage in thoughtful conversations as you get to know her better. It's honestly heartwarming if the previous actions didn't leave a bad taste in your mouth. Even if she is full of herself, she did get what she wanted, till you bid her farewell, but I guess all things come to an end. Careful when dating online, everyone! If there's one series you wouldn't expect a sympathetic villain from, it's the Sonic series. A bald robot creator, a Bowser knockoff, whatever Black Doom is, not a lot of room for a villain to feel sorry for. That is, unless you flip the pages of the Tale of the Black Knight and the surprise main threat, Merlina. After Merlina learned the fate of her kingdom, 
she planned on using the scabbard of King Arthur to create an eternal world, one that never ends and is spared of death. Summoning Sonic to defeat King Arthur was just a ruse, a means to the end of her plan, only to be bested by Sonic, who ensures her to enjoy every moment she has, just as anyone should. Uh, this is a Sonic game, right? I know everyone makes a joke, but... Yeesh, this somehow hits hard. Her double cross might be more apparent than other villains, but her reasons make her understandable. Fearing death and ruin is common, and a fact not everyone wants to accept. Some will find any way to avoid it, ignorant of the fact that all things have their end, as I alluded to in the previous entry. Once it is understood, life then seems to have a bigger meaning, allowing you to enjoy even the small moments and appreciate everything around you. Yes, she lies to get her way and seemingly dooms her kingdom in means for eternal life, but let's be real, it makes for a great final boss and stellar music that matches Merlina's motives to a T and how far she will go to achieve them. If you need a reason to play Black Knight, for any reason, it's for how great of a villain Merlina is. Better than the roundhouse kick. Ugh, sorry, I am STILL petty over that. You know that common countdown rule that content creators have, where they have to play the games in order for the count for the entry? Well, this entry is the main reason I didn't include that rule. There was no way I could talk about sympathetic villains without this Mario character. Yes, a Mario character. Count Black, everybody! Before you get to truly know him, Count Black kidnaps most of the Mushroom Kingdom to force a wedding between Peach and Bowser, creating the Chaos Heart. With the Chaos Heart, Black would start to destroy every dimension, leaving nothing behind. Mario intervenes, but Black attempts everything to stop him, from brainwashing Luigi to sending his followers to stop them. Once Mario attains what he needs to save all dimensions, Black engages him in battle where he... hopes to lose. Turns out, once upon a time, he was known as Blumier, and while mortally injured, a girl named Timpani cared for him, and the two eventually fell in love despite Blumier's father's wishes. Before their marriage, his father wiped her memory and left Timpani to die, being saved by turning into then Mario's ally, Tippy. Blumiere searched far and wide to find her, but to no avail. Believing his life is forfeit without her, he planned to wipe all dimensions out of existence, becoming Count Black. Once he realized near the end of the game who Tippy really was, he begged Mario to stop his plan by killing him. Shenanigans ensue, leading Black to finally wed Timpani, sacrificing themselves to save all dimensions. Yes, it boils down to Mario's Romeo and Juliet, but yeesh, does it pull your heartstrings. Black is such a great antagonist, and you truly do feel sorry for what he went through, much more so when he finds out the truth and secretly hopes for his defeat. He ends up doing the right thing and even gets rewarded for it by finally marrying his true love, even if it met his demise. Well, apparent demise anyway. A great threat with an even greater story, Count Black will always be remembered as one of Mario's greatest foes. HOW DID WE GET STICKER STAR AFTER THIS?! HOW?! One beloved RPG after another, we enter the world of Fire Emblem. Three Houses, more specifically, was one of my favorite experiences. The memorable cast of characters, the thoughtful and engaging gameplay, it was a great time. And while I initially thought the main antagonist was kinda weak, upon research, I now understood how great she was. The Flame Emperor herself, Edelgard. Initially one of your classmates, depending on your route, she is the princess and the future emperor of the Adresian Empire, 
and a very kind and loyal ally to have. She's always there to back you up in a fight and isn't afraid to be really supportive when need be. Alas, she has secret motives to overthrow the church and rule over all lands. The reason why might be questionable at first, until you look at the scars underneath. At a very young age, she was forced to undergo experimentations by an evil society backed by the very empire she was from. Many of her siblings died or went insane during this, leaving Edelgard the only survivor with a second crest. Crests being sign of power gifted by the goddess. This second crest, however, tainted her hair white and severely shortened her lifespan, forever changing her views on the crests and church as a whole. As the Flame Emperor, she allied with dark forces to dismantle the church and end the succession of crests, aiming to create an equal world with no nobility, no matter the cost. However, many of the paths in the game end the same, her forces cut down and her then allies being her downfall, her life coming to an end by the very professor she admired. Edelgard was such an interesting foe. You could see she cared for her fellow students, and especially Byleth, whom she trusted the most. However, her emotional scars ran too deep. No matter what the school did for her, or the many friends she made along the way, she still intended on bringing down the church and ending the line of crests. She even laments how she wished Byleth would be right by her side right before her death, giving him, or her, many chances to join her side right before the inevitable final battle. This doesn't even include her friendship with Dimitri, which helps him to become an even more memorable character because of Edelgard. If you need help to understand, look no further than the song, The Edge of Dawn, beautifully capturing Edelgard's intentions and desires, even keying into her thoughts depending on the four routes. Despite her actions, you understand why she goes down her path. If it weren't the time period it was, she might have even succeeded, but alas, we know how it goes. Just like the axe she carries, a swift character gets a brutal end. Well, at least we know the gatekeeper will be safe. Greetings, Professor. Nothing to report. Batman is known to have amazing antagonists, so many that there are countless videos and articles listing them all. You get the campy ones, the serious ones, the iconic ones, and of course, the sympathetic ones. To get the latter, look no further than the Batman Telltale series, and my choice, Lady Arkham. I was going to go for Telltale's version of Joker, but perhaps it's best to save him for another time. Lady Arkham is a new threat to Gotham, vowing to reveal the corruption of the city and purify it. This includes the likes of Mayor Hill and the Wayne family, much to the dismay of our Dark Knight. She uses the drug to enrage people with violent instincts taking hold, as she terrorized the city in the name of her revenge against the Waynes. Why? Oh boy, that's a mess in itself. Lady Arkham is actually Vicky Vale. Yes, that Vicky Vale. She was once known as Victoria Arkham, her parents once owning Arkham Asylum. They were killed by a mob led by their boss, Thomas Wayne, and Vicky was adopted, where she was brutally abused and vowed vengeance upon the city and the Waynes, getting her inspiration from the only doll that she had while being kept up by her adopted parents. Using her connection with the Gazette and criminals like the Penguin, she came close to achieving her goal, going as far as convicting Bruce to the Asylum. All comes to a point, however, where Batman has his final showdown with Lady Arkham, ending in her supposed death, never to be seen again. A memorable design, well thought out plan, and a backstory that really makes you feel for her. It turned a minor character into one of the most compelling adversaries Batman ever fought. If you end up revealing your identity to her, she's so far out the deep end she can't realize the good you do, just because of the Wayne family line and how it affected her. 
She's great in the fight, very strategic, and leaves a legacy that most Batman foes wish they could for the future of this iteration of the night. Leave it to Telltale for making one of Batman's newest foes one of the greatest. Now if only we had an action figure of her. While I doubt you heard of it, The Witch and the Hundred Knight is a great diamond in a rough. A unique presentation, a well thought out story, and a great cast of characters. From the starring role Metallia, to our focus for number 5, the Swap Witch Mani, what's known as the Maiden Agony. Agony was a maiden, back then known as a witch, who was used as a distraction for the dark god Nike who then ruled over the land with his dark power. The two fell in love, but the other witches and kingdoms used this love to destroy Nike's physical form and trap his power, draining it away using the swamps. Agony vowed revenge and planned a way to release Nike so the two could take their vengeance upon the world that wronged them. Reincarnated as the Swamp Fairy Mani, she learned that Metalia's powers drained the swamp, thus draining Nike's strength. Using Metalia's urge to explore the world and prove her power, she destroys the pillars that trap the god, thus releasing Nike once more. The reunion is cut short when Nike is defeated for good and Agony following suit, ironically reuniting them in the afterlife. It was honestly clever how Mani used others to get her way duping Metallia for as long as she did to break the seals of Nike, biding her time while appearing to be trusting all. When Metallia couldn't assist the Hundred Knight, Mani used it to her advantage to defeat those who kept the god at bay. I'll be honest, I didn't expect the twist coming right up until it was time for the reveal. I... Props game? Major props. Uh, good job, good job. Gold stars all around. To be used as a sacrifice, only to find love and have it taken away. 1,000 years later, her revenge was nigh, taken away, and she still got what she wanted in a way. Honestly, a really good antagonist. Oh, and she's voiced by Haru from Persona 5. Let that mental image burn in your minds. Maybe I'll fetch the axe. Okay, everybody breathe for a moment. Everyone alright? Good. Time to try and explain Blaze Blue lore. Don't get me wrong, it's a great story. But if you thought Kingdom Hearts was hard to keep up with... Yeah, I'm gonna try and simplify it as best I can. So, to start off, here's a joke. You know why 8 is afraid of 7? 7, 8, 9 the Phantom. Oh, okay, okay. Bad joke, but hey, gotta segment somehow. Known as one of the most powerful sorcerers in terms of magic, she helped teach magic to the world and even created her own version through science to benefit the world. She cared for her little sister Celica greatly. And though had a rough exterior, she deeply cared for those who were close to her. This all came to an end during the Dark War, as one of the six heroes who helped save the world. After one of the heroes betrayed everyone else, she was killed with her mental state locked in a body created by Relius Clover. Beforehand, she learned the fate of the world, to be completely reset by the origin each time Ragna died an insured event by dark forces, which meant Nine's father and sister would relive their tragic deaths each reset, knowing that the world resetted hundreds of times. Determined to end the cycle, she created divine weapons and a replacement god in the hopes to save her family no matter the price. Once her power was released and she was brought back, she continued her work no matter the cost. 
Confronted by the heroes and her sister, Nine was later found by Izanami. Nine using the replacement god to temporarily stop her and give the heroes enough time to stop Izanami and any threats that go against her wishes, sacrificing herself to buy the time they need. A respected woman for her power and deep love for her family, you can understand why she went through what she did, the amount of length she went to to ensure that this cycle ended. Though her intentions were not completely pure, it was all to give her family a chance at better lives, especially her sister. She may come off as evil, but she ended things on a good note, giving the heroes the chance to live out better lives in the end. Certainly one of the better antagonists of the series. Okay, did I good did I, did I do did I, did I, did I do a good job? Can 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 we move on now? We can? Neat. Uh, question. Can we still reference Undertale? We can? Sweet! Because I have the determination to do so for our next entry. Plowy the Flower. Yes, a flower. And yes, I'll explain. It's kind of my job. Once a child called Azriel Dreamer, he was the son of the King and Queen of the Monsters. One day he found a child named Kara and took them in as a sibling to nurture back to full health. Kara, however, tricked Azriel to go to the human village, being killed by the humans and starting a war between humans and monsters. Azriel's remains left in a garden. An experiment using those flowers and determination reincarnated Azrael as Flowey the Flower. He was left emotionless and wished to no longer live and tried to make that happen. However, he was brought back to life, realizing the ability to keep coming back. You could say his life was a save state. He began to experiment with the world, finding every event in existence. He grew bored, however, and vowed a way to end the world he deemed uninteresting. Depending on your route, you prove Flowey wrong and venture to free the monsters. However, using the remaining souls and monsters, Azrael returned to his original form in a godlike state, vowing to restart the timeline instead, assuring no one would care for you, thus trying to prove his point. Through the souls, you remind Azrael of that care and vow to save Azrael as well, caring for him unlike Kara. Azrael gives up, apologizing for his actions, caring for the first time, and giving up his power and self to free the monsters. Before his existence ends, if you find him, Azrael begs the player to not be like Flowey, that though are some like him, it is better off to care and enjoy life around you. For a flower, Azrael and Flowey, by extension, show the power of caring for others. When you don't, it doesn't matter what happens to anyone, with little value through it. By giving the effort, caring for others brings them happiness, and betters the world one person at a time. After being betrayed by the one person he trusted most, Azrael resented that care, and only by giving him the care he lost does Azrael truly exist. Only to give that back for the sake of everyone else. Okay, uh, alright, well... <laughs> okay, two more! Two more! How much worse could it get? Oh, come on! <sighs> okay, fine. Here we go. Spider-Man's foes are a lot like Batman's. By that, I mean they're fun to watch, and most of the time, sympathetic in an enjoyable sense. Sandman, the Lizard, the list goes on. The most famous example being Otto Octavius, better known as Doc Ock. And Insomniac Spider-Man shows that in the best way possible. Otto is the boss of Peter Parker, but above all else, a great friend. 
Upon seeing the spider suit, he vows to help Peter create gadgets for Spider-Man while endeavoring his own goals to create advanced prosthetic limbs for others. And out of himself, since his body is deteriorating and will soon be unable to move due to his condition. Norman cuts Otto's funding, shutting down his dreams, and you can guess where that goes. He secretly creates better equipment for Spider-Man's bows, causing a breakout in the raft, and creating the Sinister Six to take revenge on Osborn, Otto's mental state giving in due to the neurochip that was implanted in him. He releases a deadly chemical upon the city that Norman helped create, attacking Norman's strong points and then abducts Osborn to confess his wrongs to the city. Aunt May and countless others affected by these actions, Peter has no choice but to stop Otto, going into a great fight, in the process though, having the biggest secret revealed. Such a disappointment. Parker. You knew? Knowing Otto knew the secret the entire time, and knowing the danger he put him through, Peter defeats the new Dark Ock, saving the city, but leaving behind his former, now lost friend. It's one of those strange occurrences where you know the twist will happen, but it's done so well, you honestly don't care. The tragic story of Doc Ock is very present, but done in a more impactful way, on a personal level. Otto was a friend and true inspiration to Peter. He wanted nothing more than to help Otto out because of the friendship they had. But Otto's lust for vengeance took hold, and where it takes him is unreal. He even went as far as to help the villains he enlisted with their problems, vowing to save them once the job was done. Probably the last of his good-natured humanity left. You truly feel sorry for Octavius, and though you want Osborne to pay as well, Otto just took it too far, so he needed to be stopped as well. Peter's lines during the final fight summarize it perfectly. I love this version of Doc Ock. Possibly not as much as Molina's, but pretty dang close. But. All said and done, after everything we went through, there's only one sympathetic villain left. But first, the obvious and always honorable mentions. President Hartman from Kirby Planet Robobot a man who vowed to find his daughter only for the technology used taking him over. Did not expect that from a Kirby game of all things. Sia from Hyrule Warriors. Realizing your crush will never love you but ripping apart timelines to make it happen under the dark influences of Ganon. <sighs> Just make sure you don't show him your Master Sword. Game said it, not me. John Bisson from Sly 2. Sly honestly said it perfectly in the cutscene. I have to feel a little sorry for him. He's just a normal guy from the 1850s. Back in his day, he'd be a hero, but today, he's a villain. Really great antagonist, though. Sly's known for some of the coolest, too. And finally, Herbert from Club Penguin. A polar bear who wanted the warmth from a cold place. A great relic from a lost past. <sighs> Gosh darn it, Disney. Shocker if you knew this was coming. I can't help but love Persona 5, it's great cast. Villains, however, is another story. You have unlikable schmucks like Kamoshida and Shido, villains you wanted to like more like Akechi, and I probably angered the fanbase just from saying that. A good choice for this list would have been Kuanichi Nose from Strikers. She fits the bill for everything a sympathetic would need, but... This is the one time I'm glad I was spoiled. <laughs> While 
While I had every intention of returning to Royal, I never quite finished it. I was spoiled on this, and found my meaning to return to the game stat. But before I do, let's talk about Dr. Takuto Maruki. He was brought to Shujin Academy to help with their PR, and took his job quite seriously. He wanted to help everyone he talked to, including those impacted by Kamashita's actions, leading to your involvement of him. And snacks. Plenty, plenty of snacks. He became a great ally to the thieves, helping them grow stronger and venting their inner desires. Even the thieves outside of the schools, like Futaba and Yusuke, get a chance to talk to him, and it really does help him out. Deep down, however, he held a great secret. He himself wielded a persona of his own. It was given to him when he was dealing with his then fiancé's episodes, allowing the person he conversed with their desire in order to help them with their problems. This became a further truth once the God of Control was taken down, gaining the full power of his persona and gaining a palace of his very own. Still grieving with his emotions deep inside, he vowed to remove all grief and give the people the happy lives he thought everyone deserved. Even the lives of the thieves were changed, Ryuji being a star of the track again, Makaba alive for Sojiro and Futaba, even Morgana becoming human like he always wanted. In the end, Joker realized something felt wrong, and alongside the very much alive Akechi, began the efforts to bring the fake reality to an end. Maruki is courteous though, and gives Joker the chance to accept or deny this reality. Slowly, Joker and the team venture through the palace, learning of Maruki's tragic past and wishes for a better and happier world. Though Maruki pleads to keep this reality, in the end, it leads to the battle Maruki didn't wish for, but needed to happen for his wish to be true. After the thieves defeat Maruki and escape the palace, Maruki surprises everyone by standing his ground and his persona evolves, leading to another grueling battle. Through a sick finisher, Maruki is defeated for good, his persona gone, and the reality he created starting to break. Maruki stops Joker's escape, asking him to help one last time, venting his true emotions in a fist fight, realizing his situation, finally giving in. In the end, he realizes he can start over, bringing people happiness in his own way, bidding farewell to Joker. And oh, what a great character! This character, this one character, is the reason this list is a thing. A lovable person with many great moments, one of the best arcs I've ever witnessed, and one I can really connect with. Even before the big reveal, he's just a sweet, lovable man who only wishes to help people through their rough times. Afterwards is when that really takes hold, and the ultimate question arises. Is it better to take grief away and live a happy life, or to go through that grief and live a satisfying life knowing some may fall in the process? Maruki went through a lot, losing his fiance to help her feel better, having his research taken by Shido, things that would normally break anyone. But Maruki ignored that grief and pressed on, leading to him changing the fate of all humans, to live a happier life and get everything they desired. Yes, I'm repeating it, but it has to be stated how good his intentions were. Once he sees that grief is sometimes necessary for a better life, he finally gives in and I honestly broke down in happy tears. Maruki truly is one of those antagonists who you don't want to see lose, yet you know you need to take him down. The funny thing is, you're given the choice not to several times, to allow his reality to exist or not. The choice makes him even more sympathetic. He doesn't want to fight you, yet doesn't manipulate you into choosing. He gives you the free will to choose, and at times you may want to accept his offer. Never before was I so torn about a choice, but this? This really made me think about everything my life was about. That isn't an exaggeration either. I honestly stood still for 10 minutes at least 
thinking about this one choice. It... It's honestly impressive. Even his theme, Throw Your Mask Away, is a plea to Joker to keep his reality. And it really gets you in his mindset. He doesn't want to fight, but he doesn't want to give up the reality he wants. If you truly make me think and reflect on my life choices, you truly deserve respect. What a great character. What a great battle. What a great story. And I need to finish Persona 5 Royal. I'm the gaming genius. And you may get the happiness you deserve. After all, it's your choice how to live it out. This gaming wish has just been granted. Now where's my controller?